You may remain seated. This morning, uh, in place of a sermon, we're going to do something just a little bit different. We're going to have more of a relaxed talk through of the book of Philemon. So for this study, there's two different sheets that you need. They were handed out at the beginning. The ushers are going to walk by, so raise your hand nice and high. If you need a sheet, we need uh, two up in front up here. Anybody else? Ushers are walking around. Raise them up high. Got a couple more on the left side up here. All right, keep those hands raised up high if you still need one. I know uh, Jonah needs one in the back. See him raising his hand? All right, keep those hands raised up high. The ushers will continue to hand them out if you need them. So we're going to study the book of Philemon. And in order to understand this book, I'm going to read through the entire book. In order to understand this book, you have to know just a little bit about the characters before we start. Okay, So character one is the Apostle Paul. He is the one who is writing this letter. We all know about the Apostle Paul. He wrote a lot of the New Testament letters like Ephesians, Galatians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, things like that. Okay, so we have the Apostle Paul. He's writing this letter. He's writing this letter to a man named Philemon. That is the second character. As we read the book, we're going to, we can learn uh, kind of from the details that Philemon was probably a wealthy man. One, we will understand that he's a slave owner. And two, it's going to mention that Philemon has the church in his city meet at his house. So Philemon has enough material wealth to host a gathering of the local church, and he's a slave owner. So Philemon's probably a wealthy guy. Paul is writing a letter to Philemon, and Paul is writing on behalf of of a man named Onesimus. That's character number three, Onesimus. Onesimus is a runaway slave. And Onesimus formerly was the slave of Philemon. Okay, so that's just a little introduction to the characters. We have Paul writing this letter to Philemon, a wealthy slave owner. He's writing it in behalf of Onesimus, a runaway slave. Now just turn your attention to the book itself. I'll read the book. You all follow along as I read. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Appiah, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. That's where we learned that the church met at Philemon's house, to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me, so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But 
I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greeting, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So make sure when you go home today, you tell your friends and family, my church is just really awesome and intense. We studied an entire book of the Bible today in church. That is the entire book of Philemon, a very little book. So, From this book, we learn that Onesimus, this runaway slave, is in a very dire situation. I bet you can guess it. What do you think the penalty for a runaway slave was? Somebody shout it out. It's okay. Yeah, I heard it. Death. Okay? That was the penalty for a runaway slave. So Onesimus is in a very dire situation. And a runaway slave was at about the bottom of the social ladder. This runaway slave had no rights before Roman law. His master could do anything to him that he wanted. And um, he had no standing in Roman society. He had no right to go before his master and say, hey, I'm sorry, his master could do anything he wanted with him. So Onesimus needs a mediator. He's in a hopeless situation, and he has no power to fix this situation. And it's probably interesting to note, Onesimus is probably the one carrying this letter. The Apostle Paul says, I'm sending Onesimus back to you in the letter. So Onesimus is probably carrying this letter to his former master, Philemon, and he's probably quaking in his boots, hoping to God that Philemon opens the letter before he decides what to do. Because Philemon could just say, oh, off to the gallows with you. We're going to have you killed for being a runaway slave. So Onesimus is in a very dire situation. Now I want you just to take 30 seconds to yourself. On our study sheet, uh, in bold and underlined, it says reflect. Take a moment to think of someone in your life who might be an Onesimus. Is there someone you know who is in a situation that they are powerless to change? Have you ever felt like Onesimus? Have you ever felt like you were in a hopeless situation? Would it have helped if someone mediated on your behalf? Just take 30 seconds. Uh, You can talk with your neighbor if you want, but take 30 seconds and reflect on that question. Right, that was probably about 30 seconds. So we all understand that Onesimus is in a very dire situation. No standing in Roman society, no rights before the law. The penalty for a runaway slave is death. He needs a mediator. So thankfully, he gets about the best mediator you possibly could, the Apostle Paul. 
What is the Apostle Paul's situation right now? Where is he? Somebody shout it out. He's in jail, right? The Apostle Paul himself is a prisoner right now. So he can relate a little bit with Onesimus. He says, I'm in chains, I'm a prisoner, um, but Paul would be a very good mediator. So Paul starts his letter by reminding Philemon of who he is. At that very beginning section, he says, oh Philemon, I've heard about your love, just how you have refreshed the saints I know you have faith. You're a partner with me in the gospel. You know, I started the church at your at, that you're at, and you are the one who allows people to gather at your house. We have a partnership in sharing the gospel. So the Apostle Paul reminds Philemon of who he is. You're a loving man. You're a man who has faith. You and I have a partnership in the gospel. Philemon, you have this reputation of helping God's people. The Apostle Paul starts out by saying, this is who you are, Philemon, reminding him of who he is. Paul was a perfect man to mediate for Onesimus because he had ethos. In classical Greek persuasion, ethos is credibility based on character. So what does that mean? Well, the Apostle Paul had a personal relationship with Philemon. The Apostle Paul says, you owe me your very self. What he means by that is the Apostle Paul was the first one who told Philemon about Jesus. So they had this personal relationship. Paul says, you owe me your very self. Paul was also one of the apostles. He had credibility based on character. It's really interesting at the start, Paul says, Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. He's saying, I'm an apostle. I'm one of the heads of the church. I could simply order you to do what I want. That's my apostolic authority. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to appeal to you on the basis of love. Paul also has credibility based on character because of his situation. He says, Philemon, I'm an old man now. And I'm in chains for the gospel. You know who I am. Please humor me. I'm an old man in chains for the gospel. So Paul has credibility based on character. Let's flip to the back. Not only does he have credibility based on character, but he also uses some logical arguments. The apostle Paul says, Philemon, Onesimus is a changed man. Formerly he was useless to you, Now he has become useful. If you look back at your sheet at verse 11, that's where it says formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. That verse, verse 11, that's a pun in Greek. The name Onesimus means the useful one. And it was a name often given to slaves. This is Onesimus. This is the useful one. Okay, so in verse 11, Paul makes a pun. He says, formerly he was useless, un-Onesimus. Now he has become Onesimus. He has become useful. I'm in chains right now. I'm in jail. I can't do anything. Onesimus has become my friend and my helper. He does things for me. He has become very useful. Now he is our partner in sharing the gospel. Formerly he was useless. He was un-Onesimus. Now he has become Onesimus. He has become useful. Paul also mentioned that he wants to keep Onesimus with him. Uh, I want to keep him with me because he's useful, but we have to do the right thing. We have to clear up this situation. So I'm sending him back to you. And lastly, Paul makes this beautiful emotional appeal for Onesimus. Just when you read through this letter, some of the emotion language is absolutely beautiful. This is my son. He's very dear to me. He's very dear to you. He is our partner in sharing the gospel. I want you to treat him as if I myself were standing before you. Just this absolutely a beautiful emotional appeal for this slave. And think about this. Nobody else would do this. 
Nobody else would stake their reputation and themselves on a runaway slave. But the Apostle Paul equates Onesimus with himself and says, he's my son. He's very useful to me. He's very dear to me. He's our partner in sharing the gospel. And lastly, Paul does something very smart when you're dealing with a conflict. At the very end of the letter, he says, oh, one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me so that I can come visit you. He's following up on the situation. You know, there's this conflict. Paul is trying to resolve it. And at the end of the letter, he says, one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored for you. He's telling Philemon, I'm going to come visit you and follow up on this situation to see what the outcome was. Very smart when you're trying to mediate a conflict. All right, think about this question to yourselves and you can talk with your neighbor. Agree or disagree and explain. Paul is asking Philemon to give Onesimus his freedom. Take 30 seconds and think about that. And you can talk with your neighbor. Agree or disagree and explain. Paul is asking Philemon to give Onesimus his freedom. Anybody want to be brave and give their thoughts? It's scary to talk in front of a crowd. It's one of the number one phobias. So, but anybody want to be brave and give their thoughts? Please, Mark. Yeah, that's my question. You have to answer the question. <laughs> the question. The question is, you know, no, you're very right. Thank you for defining the question better. Uh, the question is, is Paul asking Philemon just to simply forgive him and accept him back into his household? Or is the Apostle Paul asking him to give Onesimus his freedom? Jeannie, please. Yeah, so, you, so that's what you, what you think. Yep. Anybody else agree or disagree? Anybody else want to be brave? I thought I saw one more hand. Tom, please. Right, you're, you're speaking in the midst of the group. Right. Right, right. So um, for those of you who couldn't hear, Tom said uh, he never comes right out and says, give Onesimus his freedom. Um, He does ask him to forgive him and things like that. Um, So yeah, we can't answer this question for sure. I'll give you my opinion. Um, Look back at your sheet and look at the very bolded verse. Verse 13 says, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. That is the very middle of the letter. Um, Usually when we write essays and things like that, we have an introduction where we state our point, we put some supporting arguments, and then there's a big conclusion. That's how we read. That's how we write. In Greek literature, you uh, go up to the middle, and then you go down. So the point of the whole letter is at the very middle. 
This is the very middle verse. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. So that's the very middle verse. Now, we primarily have a Northern European culture, right? In Northern European culture, we're very direct. So I would say, um, Tom, would you please go get me a glass of water? I'm very thirsty. I'm not actually asking you. Um, but that's how I would request, you know, Tom, would you please go get me a glass of water? Very direct. Other cultures are much more indirect with their communication. Lots of Hispanic cultures are indirect. So if uh, Tom and I are in an indirect culture, I might say, oh, Tom, I'm just parched. You know, I'm up here preaching. I can't really leave. Um, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. And if Tom and I are in the same culture and it's an indirect culture, he understands perfectly that I'm asking him to go get me a glass of water. That's how they communicate. I think that Paul is asking Philemon to give Onesimus his freedom in an indirect way. He says, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me. He's very useful to me. You know, it's really a loss having this guy leave. You know, I'm in chains. I need people to deliver messages and help me out. So I think he's uh, asking Philemon to uh, uh, give Onesimus his freedom. But I don't think we can say 100% for sure. All right, reflections and applications. We can view this account as a picture of our relationship with God. We are Onesimus, Philemon is God the Father, and Paul is Jesus. Uh, take 30 seconds and just ponder these next three questions on your own. You can talk with your neighbor. In what ways are we similar to Onesimus? In what ways does Paul act like Christ in this story? And in what ways is the way Paul felt about Onesimus similar to the way Jesus feels about us? Go ahead and ponder that for about 30 seconds. Anybody want to share a thought and be brave? In what ways are we similar to Onesimus? Anybody want to be brave and share a thought? If not, that's okay. It's, it's hard to speak. In. Please, Rob. We needed a mediator, right? Um, we needed Jesus. We were helpless to change our own situation. That's uh, one way in which we're similar. Anything else? And never be afraid to state the obvious. Please, Lee. We're slaves to sin and we deserve death. Absolutely. The penalty for our sin is death. The penalty for Onesimus was death. Those are some really good thoughts. Another thought is we have no standing before God and no right to come before God. Uh, Jesus is the one who has standing and a right to come before God. And he does that on our behalf. In what ways does Paul act like Christ? Anybody have a thought about that? I think this is just absolutely beautiful. Let's reread re verse 17 and 18. Paul says, So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. 
If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. That's exactly what Jesus did for us, right? Um, everything we did wrong, he said to God the Father, you know, if they owe you anything, if they have done you any wrong, charge it to me. Onesimus probably had stolen when he fled. You know, you can't just run away. You need some food, clothing, and supplies for the road. Uh, not only that, but Philemon lost some labor. So the Apollo says, I'll pay for it. That's what Jesus did for us. He said, I'll pay for all their sins. Not only that, but Jesus gave us his reputation and his perfect life. Paul says, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. That's what Jesus says about us to the Father. He says, welcome them as you would welcome me. I have given all of them my perfect life, my perfect reputation, so treat them as you would treat me. And God the Father treats us as his perfect, wonderful children for the sake of Jesus. So, I hope you learned a little bit about the book of Philemon today. Just as you go home, ponder these two questions. Think of two people in your life who are at odds with one another. What things do we learn from Paul about mediating for two people? And this one, as you go home, pray that God would give you the wisdom and courage to help people reconcile. Amen. Please rise.